good evening. We were discussing steam power cycle. So, steam power cycle is basically a heat engine cycle where steam is used as the working substance. So, <coughs> the working medium, working fluid medium is steam. So, in the part of the cycle, it will be in the form of steam. In part of the cycle, it will be in the form of water. Now, as in a heat engine cycle, always it is the motto or it is the attempt of the engineers to have the maximum output from the cycle. So, in the steam power cycle also, we will try to have the maximum output from the cycle. And if the heat source and heat sink are given, as I have discussed in the previous day, in the class of the previous day. So, <coughs> we can construct a, uh, <coughs> a reversible cycle between the given heat source and heat sink to have the maximum output. And one can think of a Carnot cycle. So, basically I will try to construct a Carnot cycle. This is the T s plane and we are trying to construct a Carnot cycle. This is the process of heat input. It is inside the two phase dome. So, basically it is evaporation or boiling process. So, in this process temperature remains constant. So, this is nothing but isothermal heat addition. Then from 2 to 3, this is reversible adiabatic expansion process. Then 3 to 4, it is reversible isothermal heat rejection process. So, this is nothing but a condensation process. And from 4 to 1, we can go back by a reversible compression process. And this compression process will also be adiabatic. It is reversible and adiabatic. So, basically we are having two reversible isothermal processes that is 1, 2 and 3, 4. Then two reversible adiabatic processes that is 2, 3 and 4, 1. It is a Carnot cycle using steam as the working fluid. Now, let us see whether we can <coughs> realize this cycle, cycle in practice or whether we have some problem in realizing it. The main problem <coughs> comes for point 4. So, here what we can see that <coughs> this is a condensation process and we, we have to stop exactly at point 4. So, that by a reversible compression process, we can go back to point 1. That means, the condensation process we have to stop somewhere in between in the two phase dome, so that we can go back to the initial point of this cycle, the starting point of the cycle. And this is very difficult to achieve. To control the condensation process in this way, it is extremely difficult. So, <coughs> this is one <coughs> reason which makes realization of Carnot cycle using steam a difficult proposition. Second thing what we can find that from 4, we are compressing the working medium so that we can go back to point 1. That is the initial point of the cycle. At point 4, what we are having? We are having a mixture of gas and liquid or vapor and liquid. Now, we know that if we have liquid only, we have got devices for increasing the pressure that is a pump. If we have vapor or gas only, then we have got devices for increasing its pressure that is a compressor. But it is very difficult to handle both liquid and gas together with the help of a device, mechanical device. Not only that, if we do that, <coughs> we will consume lot of energy. It is difficult to design such a device, if such a device is designed that will consume lot of energy also. <coughs> so, these two are two main drawbacks for realizing a Carnot cycle using steam as the 
working fluid. So, what we can do? <coughs> we can modify the Carnot cycle to some extent. So, this is Carnot cycle. So, if we modify, let us keep it side by side, then we will have T s So, if we modify, we will have 1, 2, this is again isothermal heat addition process, 2 to 3, this is reversible adiabatic expansion process and from 3 to 4, we are having isothermal heat rejection by condensation process, but here what we have done? we have not stopped the condensation process in between. We have <coughs> continued the condensation process till we get saturated liquid. Still the entire vapor is condensed to saturated liquid, we have carried out the condensation process up to that point. So, at this point at 4, we are getting saturated liquid. So, now what we can do <coughs> that we can see the cycle is being operated at two different pressure level. One is this one that is 1 to 2 that is at one pressure less level that is the boiler pressure and 3 to 4 that is at another pressure level which is the condenser pressure. So, <coughs> we are getting saturated liquid at condenser pressure. From there, we have to raise the pressure to the boiler pressure level. So, this can be done by some adiabatic compression process in a pump and then we can have heating along this constant pressure line. So, basically what we are having now, we are having another point, let us put point 5 here. <coughs> so, basically we are now having our cycle as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, we can <coughs> we can identify the processes. 5 to 2, we call it constant pressure heat addition. So, 5 to 2 that is constant pressure pre heat addition. You see <coughs> in Carnot cycle, we had constant temperature heat addition. So, here we are modifying the process slightly and we are having constant pressure heat addition, but inside the two phase, two phase zone, the constant pressure heat addition becomes a constant temperature heat addition also. Then, 2 to 3 isentropic expansion, then 3 to 4 constant temperature this is also constant pressure heat rejection. Again, this is similar to your Carnot cycle. Then 4 to 5 isentropic compression. So, we can see that basically we have modified one process that is the heat addition process. Instead of constant temperature heat addition, we have constant pressure heat addition, but the process is such that a large part of the heat addition is also at constant temperature. This cycle is known as 
Rankine cycle. So, we call it Rankine cycle. So, this is the basic Rankine cycle which we use for steam power plant, where we generate or we convert thermal energy into mechanical energy using a heat engine cycle and where the working fluid is steam that particular cycle is a Rankine cycle and we have drawn the basic Rankine cycle here. Now, in the basic Rankine cycle what we can see that we have got constant pressure heat addition. The process 512 that is your constant pressure heat addition. What we find in this constant pressure heat addition? 5 to 1 in this <coughs> region or in this part of the process, the working fluid is in subcooled liquid or it is in liquid state. At 1 it is saturated liquid, at 5 it is subcooled liquid. So, at this portion the heat addition is by constant pressure, but 1 to 2 this is within the two phase zone, this is basically evaporation process and at, the, at this condition the heat addition is both at constant pressure and constant temperature. At point 2, we are getting saturated vapor and then the saturated vapor is being expanded or it expands through the turbine. So, it follows, ideally it follows a reversible adiabatic path. If it follows a reversible adiabatic path, then <coughs> during the expansion not only its pressure decreases, also we can see that its quality falls. That means, we have started with 100 percent quality, now at point 3 we are having quality less than 100 percent or we are having wet steam. So, we have started with dry saturated steam, after the expansion we are having wet steam. Now, <coughs> from thermodynamic point of view of course, there is no problem, but from mechanical operation point of view this is not desirable. So, what will happen at the <coughs> later stage actually in a turbine steam turbine there will be different stages of turbine and as we go towards the later stages uh, downstream of the turbine. So, we will see the <coughs> amount of water that will increase in this steam and these waters are water is in the form of water droplet. So, they will impinge the turbine blades. So, <coughs> basically the density of steam and water droplet they are different. So, the inertia of the water droplet is higher. So, they will impinge the water sorry the turbine blade. So, that will create some <coughs> problem in the operation. This will not only damage the blade, but it will also reduce the generation of power. So, output also get re will get reduced due to the impingement problem of the water droplet. So, that is why the wet steam has to be avoided or at least it has to be reduced at the later stage of the turbine. So, that is why <coughs> if we start from the dry saturated condition of steam, we will get much wet steam or low quality steam, but we can improve the condition if we start with superheated steam. So, next improvement on the Rankine cycle what can be done that we will go to the superheated region inside the boiler itself and then we will allow the superheated steam to expand through the blade passages of the turbine. So, <coughs> so 
let us have 1 to 2 heating process, 2 to 3 expansion inside the turbine, 3 to 4 condensation of steam and 4 to 1 compression or pressure rise in the pump. So, this is what we will get if we use superheated steam in the steam turbine. <coughs> so, here we can see this heating process is a constant pressure process, constant pressure heat addition process. Now, <coughs> one can represent the process or cycle both in PV and HS diagram also. So, <coughs> 1 to 2 is a constant pressure heat addition, this is constant pressure heat addition 1 to 2. Then 2 to 3 that is adiabatic or reversible adiabatic expansion process. Then this is 3 and this is 4. So, 3 to 4 is condensation process, heat rejection process and again this is adiabatic compression process. So, this is how the cycle <coughs> can be represented in a PV plane. Then <coughs> if we go for HS plane, these are two pressure levels, one is boiler pressure and another is condenser pressure. So, we have started with superheated steam at point 2, it expands, it goes here, then there is constant pressure heat rejection, it becomes saturated liquid. So, this is 2, 3, this is 3, 4 and then it is it is compressed up to point 1 which is at a high pressure. So, we will have the coordinates like this H s 1 to 2 is the constant pressure heat addition, 2 to 3 is the reversible adiabatic expansion, 3 to 4 constant pressure heat rejection and 4 to 1 again reversible adiabatic compression. So, <coughs> this is the temperature at which it is being superheated. <coughs> now, you see by this modification where we are using superheated steam at the inlet of the turbine. So, <coughs> we are also gaining in work output. That means, we are using the same working substance, same amount of mass flow rate is there, but using the same amount of mass flow rate or same flow rate of the working medium, we are gaining in output. Okay. So, that is another advantage of using superheated steam. Next, let us see how we can find out the performance of the cycle. Performance of 
Rankine cycle. So, <clears throat> let us say we try to find out the efficiency of Rankine cycle. So, efficiency of Rankine cycle if we want to find out eta r that is equal to from our deficient if from our definition of efficiency for heat engine cycle, one can write <coughs> net work output divided by energy supplied. In terms of the physical quantities, we can write W t which is the turbine work that the cycle is doing minus W pump which is the pump work which has to be supplied from outside to the cycle, this divided by Q boiler. What is the thermal energy supplied to the boiler? So, it is basically the net work we will get from subtracting the pump work from the turbine work. By subtracting the pump work from the turbine work, we will get the network done by the cycle and energy supplied is nothing but what is the energy supplied to the working fluid in the boiler. So, what is W turbine? W turbine <coughs> again I will ask you to recall what we have done in first law of thermodynamics for steady state steady flow process. So, we are considering that a steam power plant is working in steady state. So, the process through a turbine is a steady flow process and in this case we are also neglecting the changes in kinetic energy and potential energy. We are also neglecting the heat transfer from the turbine. It is assumed that the turbine is well insulated. So, no heat is transferred from the turbine to the surrounding medium. If we take all this assumption, then work done in the turbine that will be the change in enthalpy between the inlet and outlet. That means, it is the change in enthalpy of the incoming stream and the outgoing stream. Now, if we do the analysis based on unit <coughs> mass flow rate of the fluid, we can write if we take this diagram, then the work done in the turbine will be H 2 minus H 3. H 2 minus H 3 is the work done by the turbine minus the pump work. The pump work is slightly involved how we can estimate the pump work. Pump work how can we estimate? We will come back to this later on, but first try to estimate what is the pump work. estimation of pump work. Now, <coughs> let us draw an exaggerated view for the calculation of pump work. So, pump work is basically
let us say this is the condensation process and this is the heat addition process as we have written this is 4, this is 1 and let us say we call this pressure as let us say this pressure we denote as P1 that is the pressure of the boiler and this pressure we denote as P4 that is the pressure in the condenser and as usual you are having TS diagram. This is the TS diagram. Okay. Now, <clears throat> how can we calculate the pump one? Now, one may say that well, just like turbine work, can we not follow the same procedure for determining the pump work? Now, there is one point here we know the enthalpy at point 4 the liquid is in saturated condition we know the condenser pressure here we know the property of the fluid. So, here we can determine the enthalpy, but at point 1 we do not know the enthalpy of the fluid from our steam table from in this steam table <coughs> as I have told that only property of the saturated fluid is given. So, one is at subcooled condition. So, what is the energy addition due to the pressurization process? We are at difficulty to find it out, but one can use some sort of a approximate analysis. From thermodynamic relationship, one can write T d s is equal to d h minus V d p. By combining first law and second law, then assuming isothermal process, one can write this equation. As it is a an isentropic process, so T d s is equal to 0, this also we can put. So, d h that can be written as V d p and we are interested to find out what is the change of enthalpy between 4 and 1. So, by this method we can find out what is the change in enthalpy between point 4 and 1 and this change in enthalpy is nothing but the work done during this process just as we have found out the work done in the turbine. So, here also we can find out what is the work done by computing what is VDP. So, <coughs> pump work we can write it is approximately equal to V into delta P. So, that is V one can write V 4 saturated liquid I am writing S L that is saturated liquid at condition 4 the specific volume of saturated liquid we can find out from this steam table and delta P we can write down it is nothing but P 1 minus P 4. So, this will give you the work done by the pump. All right. With this, we can go back to our previous analysis and then we can write this is V 4 saturated liquid and P 1 minus P 4. This is the work done by the pump. Then what is the heat addition in the boiler? Again, if we go back to our earlier diagram. So, H 2 enthalpy at condition 2 that is the enthalpy of the steam which is coming out of the boiler and H 1 is the enthalpy of water which is 
entering the boiler. So, simply we can write H2 minus H1. H2 minus H1. That we can write simply and from there we can get the efficiency of the Rankin cycle. Now, <coughs> you see in some cases a simplification can be made. If the boiler pressure is not very high, this is basically P 1 minus P 4 and P 1 is the boiler pressure, P 4 is the pressure of the condenser, it is close to atmospheric pressure. Now, if the boiler pressure is not very high, then this quantity, this total quantity work done by the pump that is not high and that is small, quite small compared to the work done by the turbine. So, in that case the total quantity can be neglected and one can write eta r is approximately equal to H 2 minus H 3 divided by H 2 minus H 1. So, this is an approximate expression for the efficiency of Rankine cycle. All right. So, either we can use the previous expression or if the boiler pressure is not very high, then we can moderately moderate level of boiler pressure, we can use this expression for determining the efficiency of the Rankine cycle. <coughs> yes, actually <coughs> if we see the justification for this simplified expression for efficiency, this is the T s plane and we are having the two phase dome like this and the constant pressure lines are like this. So, basically this is your point 4 and this is your point 1. So, when the pressure level is low in the boiler, so one can see that 4 and 1 are quite close and their enthalpies are also comparable. So, the difference between H 4 and H 1 is small that is why it is neglected. This can be made clear if we go to H s diagram. In H s diagram where it, the enthalpy values are there, there also you will find that this will give a very small value compared to the enthalpy difference between point 2 and point 3. So, that is why this assumption is made sometimes. V f value. <coughs> we will take up some problem and then it will become clear. Definitely we will practice some problem on steam cycle. Now, <coughs> let us see methods for improving the performance of Rankine cycle. Methods for improving the performance of Rankine cycle. Now, you see <coughs> the way I have analyzed it, if we take some representative value of boiler pressure and representative value of condenser pressure. Take the values of enthalpy from the steam table 
and calculate the efficiency, we will see that we are not getting a very high efficiency. The efficiency is quite low and always we try to have high efficiency from the from a heat engine cycle which is used in practice. So, one can think of different ways by which the efficiency of a Rankine cycle is improved. So, there are different methods by which one can improve the efficiency of Rankine cycle. Now, <coughs> firstly what one can do, one can increase the boiler pressure. Actually, what I am doing by increasing the boiler pressure, I am increasing the pressure of the supply steam or pressure of the steam which is going to the turbine. So, basically I am increasing the <coughs> energy content of the steam, okay. at higher pressure it will have a larger enthalpy. But you see that there are mechanical problems as we increase the boiler pressure all the tubings etcetera are to be made thick and considerable cost increase in volume. So, one cannot go on increasing the boiler pressure arbitrarily. So, there are some limitation okay, from practical point of view. So, <coughs> so uh, probably this exact values etcetera we will discuss when we will uh, learn about boiler, but it is <coughs> sufficient to know at this point that we cannot increase the pressure arbitrarily. So, there are some limitation up to which we can increase the boiler pressure. Then one can increase the superheat increasing the degree of superheat. So, this can be again this has got the same advantage that means, we are having the same working substance, we are having the same basic equipment, but when we are using steam with a higher degree of superheat and supplying it to the turbine. So, energy content of the steam is higher and one can <coughs> expect more work output and possibly a higher efficiency. But again, there is mechanical constraint as it is a steady flow device, the part of the boiler will always be exposed to very high temperature. The high temperature steam is going to the turbine, so turbine blading will be always subjected to high temperature and material failure will take place if we go to extremely high temperature. So, from the material point of view, what maximum temperature can be, I mean <coughs> can be associated with the flowing stream that is limited and we cannot go beyond that. So, though we try for increase of pressure and increase of temperature, basically from material point of view, mechanical point of view, we have got limitation in these cases. The third thing which is tried is reheating of steam and fourth what can be tried is regenerative feed heating. I have just written the name, but I have not explained it because they need certain <coughs> elaborate discussion. So, reheating and regenerative feed heating, I will discuss it in a bit details because they are very important means for improving the performance of a steam power cycle or a Rankine cycle. <coughs> so, in reheating what is done that steam is initially superheated in the boiler, then it is sent to the turbine in the turbine it expands not up to the condenser pressure up to some intermediate pressure. Then 
this steam is taken to the boiler again where it is again heated back to a high temperature and sent back to the lower stage of the turbine where it expands up to the condenser pressure. So, <coughs> heating is done at two stages. Initially, we heat the subcooled water to get superheated steam, then we heat the low pressure steam to get again superheated steam and using the same working material, we can extract more work. So, <coughs> I like to draw both the mechanical arrangement and the cycle diagram for a reheating arrangement. <coughs> Let us say this is the boiler. So, we have got superheated steam. This goes to the turbine. where we can take the, we can use of course, two turbines or well, let us say there are two turbines side by side and we are taking the steam out and sending it to the boiler again for reheating then again it is going to the second stage of the turbine and then it goes to the condenser it goes to the feed pump and then it goes to the boiler. I will put the numbers to show the sequence of flow. So, let me name it. This is turbine, first stage of the turbine. This is the low pressure stage of the turbine T1 and T2 and then this is condenser and this then this is feed pump. Well, so let us give some name. <coughs> let us say as it enters the boiler, we denote it by 1. Then when it comes out from the boiler, its stage is 2. When it comes out from the turbine, it is 3. Then when it comes out from the reheater, it is 4. So, this stage is also 4. Then when finally, it comes out from the turbine, low pressure turbine at the condenser pressure, its condition is denoted by 5. After the condenser, its condition is denoted by 6 and then it goes through the feed pump and after pressure rise, its condition is denoted by 1. Now, if we have, let us try to have it on TS diagram. If we have these two diagrams side by side, it will give a good comparison. So, this is S and this is T. This is the two phase dome. So, <clears throat> let us say this is 1, this is 2, 
this is 3. This is 4. This is 4. This is 5 and this is 6. So, let me tell once again 1 to 2 we can compare both the diagram which are side by side. Let me put the arrow marks. I will come to that point within a minute. So, 1 to 2 that is the heating <coughs> inside the boiler. So, here constant pressure heating. So, here basically the subcooled liquid is being heated to the saturated liquid condition, saturated liquid, saturated liquid evaporates and then the saturated dry saturated steam is brought to superheated condition at point 2. So, then it expands in turbine T 1. So, this expansion process is 2 to 3. Now, <clears throat> this expansion process is such that either at the end of the expansion, the steam is dry saturated or it is marginally wet. Actually, it is very difficult to control the expansion process so that we will get dry saturated steam but the condition is such that it is marginally wet and then again we are going for reheating process. So, the reheating process is that takes place in the same boiler. So, <coughs> 3 to 4 is the reheating process. So, here at 4 we will get the superheated steam, but the temperature of 2 and 4 generally they are same. It is not mandatory to have the same temperature, but generally they are same. Because the highest temperature is dictated by the material property of the boiler and the turbine. So, we maintain the same highest temperature for both the initial superheated steam and the reheated steam. Then from 4 to 5, it expands in turbine T 2. So, at 5 we will get possibly at wet region this exhaust steam from the turbine and then that steam expands in the sorry that, that steam condenses in the condenser and we get saturated liquid at point 6. Then we have the feed pump and we pump the liquid from point 6 to point 1 that is to the boiler pressure. So, <clears throat> obviously, we have gained something and at the same time, we have paid something for that gain. What we have gained? We have gained with the same set of, same amount of mass flow rate, we will be able to extract more amount of work. And what we have to pay? We have to pay for the extra fuel the complexity of the plant that has increased, piping etcetera that will increase. So, these are the extra payment we have to make or extra provision we have to make for the modification of the cycle. Now, <clears throat> obviously, if we analyze the performance of the cycle, we will see that we will get more out work output per unit mass flow rate. But in terms of efficiency, we may lose, we may gain. One cannot be very much assertive that always we will have higher efficiency. <coughs> what to volume ratio that will increase? But depending on the working condition or the <coughs> state of the uh <coughs> steam at different point of the cycle, we may have a higher efficiency we may have a lower efficiency. <coughs> so, calculation of efficiency for this <coughs> superheat sorry the reheat cycle is not very 
difficult from this diagram itself we can determine it. We will have two turbine works that means efficiency reheat we will have two turbine works we can write H2 minus H3 that is one work plus H4 minus H5 that is the second work minus WP pump work we know how to calculate it and then we will have energy input that is H2 minus H1 plus energy input for reheating that is H4 minus H3. So, this will be the expression for efficiency of the reheat cycle. I think we will stop here and other thing we will do in our next class.